Continuing with this 8-bit Disney marathon, we are now going on to the good stuff. The Disney Afternoon Collection. Disney Afternoon was a two-hour block that was broken up to four 30-minute segments, each of which contained an animated series, and should each season of a particular show ends, the first series shown in the lineup would typically be dropped while the remaining three would move up a time slot, and a new one would be added to the end. This concept started in September 1990 and would end in the same month, nine years later, by which Disney 1-2 would succeed it. Plenty of shows would fill up this wonderful 90s block, but the ones I'll be talking about were those that would see a video game adaptation. These games would be first released on the NES in the 90s, and it wasn't until April 18th of this past year would they be re-released on the PS4, Xbox One, and Steam via the Disney Afternoon Collection right behind me. So what say we start this review off with a pair of gumshoe chipmunks taking on the case. This is my review of Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers 1 and 2. The Disney Afternoon Collection was released on the PS4, Xbox One, and Steam, but not the end company's SW console for some reason. Gee, I wonder why. But anyway, it contains six games that were released on the NES during the 90s with some alterations like removing the end company's name in all of these games, but all the gameplay on each of the games remain untouched. Each game in the collection gives you a choice of playing the whole game, do a time attack run, play a boss rush which is very fun, or look at the galleries of each game. They even play the theme song of Disney Afternoon, but in the glory of 8-bit. Another thing you can do is that you can play the game with borders on, which is what I did, or you can turn them off completely for a complete NES experience, and as you can see at the bottom left of the screen, there's a rewind feature. When you don't feel like using save states, which in this case you don't need to, you can hold the button down just in case you get into a bad situation, such as losing a life via enemies or pitfalls. And the rewind feature itself is a reference to when VCRs were the freaking bomb during the 80s and 90s, as we can rewind back to a specific scene or the start of a show entirely. In this video, and some other Disney videos after this, get used to seeing me rewinding some parts because as I age, my reflexes will also decline as well, giving me some game rust. And instead of the term rewind, I have a better name for it. I turn the stool. <laughs> yeah, get used to seeing that, folks, because you gotta admit it does make kind of sense. Add to the fact that JoJo's Bizarre Adventure: Diamond is Unbreakable is great, don't say. As for Chip and Dale themselves. Chip and Dale are two chipmunk cartoon characters created at Walt Disney Productions in 1943 and their names are a pun based on the name of the famous 18th century cabinet maker and furniture designer named Thomas Chippendale. Between the two of them, Chip is portrayed as the smart one in terms of having the most safe and sensical ways of planning, while Dale is more dim-witted, lazy, a little bit shy and insecure, but has a very strong sense of humor, and in some cases can come off as an enigma that makes Chip underestimate him at times. As evidenced in the 1956 short, Chips Ahoy, and not the delicious cookies, Chip is panicking that their usual nemesis, Donald Duck, is chasing them, 
but unbeknownst to Chip is that Dale is a step ahead of Chip and outmaneuvers Donald such as unscrewing the bolts to dismantle his rowboat, among many of Dale's plans. In spring of 1989, Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers was aired and the Chipmunks were now given even more distinctive personalities and they speak in normal speeds unlike the old Disney shorts. The premise is that Chip and Dale have established a detective agency in a huge acorn tree in Central Park, New York and are joined by the adventurous and cheese addict, Monterey Jack, the team's inventor, Gadget Hackwrench, who is also the Chipmunks' love interest, and Zipper, a housefly who despite his size is the loyal muscle of the team. Their mission is mostly dealing with crimes that are often too minuscule for the police to handle, usually with other animals as their clients, and the team frequently find themselves going up against two particular arch-villains, the disgraced mad scientist Professor Norton Nimnol and animal mafia leader Fat Cat. With the show so popular, it would make sense for our video games to be made, and the Disney Afternoon games would continue Capcom's rise to fame following the success of Mega Man and Street Fighter. Chip and Dale has both a single player and co-op mode, the latter of which I'm not showing but it's okay since it's difficult playing two players anyway. When selecting single player, you get to choose to play Chip or Dale, both of them playing the same as it is just cosmetic change. The plot begins with the rescue rangers receiving a case about a kitten that was abducted and they proceeded to the scene of the crime where sightings of mechanical pit bulls are spotted, which is a reference to season 1. Each individual stage is set up as a side-scrolling action game where Chip and Dale can walk, jump, duck, and pick up objects such as crates, barrels, blocks, or balls to throw at enemies. You can also pick up apples which, if carried, due to its weight, will also lower your jump height until thrown, but their size can run through any enemy without rebound. Both chipmunks can withstand only 3 direct hits before they lose a life and there are no passwords, and I'm not sure if there's a continue option as in the many years I've played this game, I've yet to get a game over. You can collect items like flower panels which after collecting enough, a floating glowing star will appear giving you an extra life. You can also collect enough white stars for an extra life as well. You can also collect acorns to restore HP, with the glowing one giving you full HP. And you can also get this power drink which allows you to jump at normal or any desired height while carrying a heavy object. Monterey Jack will occasionally appear to break down certain barricades whenever Cheese is in view, staying true to character, and in some stages, Zipper can be summoned and grant you temporary invincibility, all while Zipper homes in on any enemies on screen. Eventually, you'll come across a laboratory which is then followed by a crazed machine that zaps electricity, another throwback to the same episode in Season 1. Each time you complete a stage, you'll be thrown into a bonus stage and keep grabbing items out of the boxes before the music stops. It's then revealed that the crime was just a setup in order to capture Gadget and throw the other rescue rangers off guard. Luckily, Gadget is able to contact the team by building a wireless phone and sending a map to them via carrier pigeon, giving the team the chance they need to rescue her. After the intro stage, you'll be taken to a map where you can select which stage to go to next, and in this first part of the map, there's no need to enter every stage as you can skip some of them as stage G is your main target. Each stage has different obstacles to overcome like water that can hurt you for some odd reason, and boiling pots which count as pitfalls, and assortments of enemies such as ninja raccoons, shape-shifting aliens, killer toys like fake crates and jack-in-the-boxes, and some enemies like pistol-gripping weasels which take two hits to defeat, or storks that you can only damage their feet. The gameplay may be simple, but the stages in this game, while nice in both graphics and color, they can go quite longer than you think. And many of these stages have boss fights, which have very predictable patterns, making them easy to defeat. Though you might notice me rewinding my mistakes because, again, years of game rust, and I can't stand this catfish, or eel, I don't know, that does thunder shocks all over the place without a set pattern. But this casino cat is a real joke. After defeating stage G, you'll then be taken to the final three stages beginning with a sewer that has no boss at all but have plenty of flowers to collect to spawn more lives and full of killer crabs and ninja raccoons SHOOT! I turned the sewer! Then you go through police HQ with electric fans that either push you back or blow you away, storks which again can only be attacked by their feet, and have a showdown with a caterpillar. Again, very pathetic. 
Finally, Stage J, the Happy Tomcat Food Factory, Fat Cat's base of operations from the show, with enemies that take about two hits to defeat, conveyor belts that you need to carefully navigate, and it has the best music track in the entire game, that I think should have been in the Mega Man game. You'll then have a final match with Fat Cat, who does nothing but sit on his desk and fire cigar ashes at you, which makes him pathetic, but as you can see, Game Bros got to me again that I had to use Bites the Dust to clear my mistakes yet again. With Fat Cat defeated, he is sent to Animal Prison, which is non-existent in the show by the way. The team celebrated on a job well done, ending the first game. Now let's move on to the second game, which for this review is only my third time playing it, because the game came out around the end of the NES life cycle, making the game so rare, it cost about $500 complete on eBay, and I only played this game via emulation, but thanks to the Disney Afternoon Collection, $20 is all you need. The plot begins with a blimp flying over Animal Prison, helping to break Fat Cat from his cell after his defeat in the first game. Hours later, the rescue rangers catch a news report stating that a bomb has been set to explode at a local restaurant. With no time to waste, the team sets off to defuse the explosive before it goes off. The game plays almost exactly like the first game, with new features added to this game such as the ability for one player to pick up and throw the other player as a weapon, as well as execute a super crate throw, depending if you have enough running distance. And you can also throw diagonally up now. Unlike the first game, there is no map screen as the stages are set in a linear order, with the only exception is at the amusement park, in which the three stages in the park can be played in any order before entering the final stage. The controls are just as responsive as the first, the graphics on both stages and characters are drawn nicely and continue to be colorful and has nice animation, but the music, while good, it's not as memorable as the first. Some of the stages would have different gimmicks that can throw you off guard, especially for first timers, such as being trapped in a freezer and you must escape before the time limit is done, or knowing when to speed up or slow down the minecart. There will be some areas in some stages that right before the boss fight, Monterey Jack will give you two walnut cookies to restore your HP before advancing forward, and the bonus stage has you aiming the ball at a 1-up star, but the stage ends if you miss. Oh, come on now! I turn the stool. There you go! Unlike the first game, the bosses are much trickier, and you gotta understand some patterns. It could be fighting on platforms with running water and some crates can fall on the boss without even trying. Avoid getting blown away and know when to strike. Or aiming at the boss carefully while the stage auto-scrolls upward. I certainly hate this boss in a haunted house in which his patterns can be very random and there are three holes in the match which you can actually step on them if the room is dark, but when it's about to light up, get the heck out of the way! As for the Wrecking Ball fight, you have to jump at the right time to avoid the spawning debris from hurting you and you have to be underneath the vehicle in order to jump and throw the object as you can't penetrate the chain itself. The final level is not too bad except for these stupid cannons that like to fire at me and quickly fire again after one cannonball is off screen. Upon reaching Fat Cat, the rangers were already too late and Fat Cat has already escaped, but not before unleashing a robotic clone of himself. This battle can take a long time as this boss match is really slow and what you need to do is at least destroy one of its hands, then throw the bomb at the right time as it detonates as its blast radius needs to destroy the body armor. Fat Cat activates the self-destruct sequence in the fortress, forcing Chip and Dale to escape the collapsing layer. After reuniting with the others, the rescue rangers swear that they'll stop Fat Cat the next time he shows up, ending Chip and Dale 2. Unlike my previous videos, Chippendale 1 and 2 not only are they worth playing, but if you wanted to play Chippendale 2, you're better off getting this collection because getting a cartridge nowadays, even complete in box, is around $500, so I wouldn't exactly spend that high. I'm gonna give both of these games an 8 out of 10. These games may be short, but these games offer really good graphics, really good audio for excitement, colorful visuals like it was in the show, and also, nice game mechanics that not only brings back good memories for past gamers like myself, but it also made it easier for the current generation to try them out. Well, we're halfway through the marathon, folks. So, up next in the 8-Bit Disney Marathon, we're going to be looking at a very beloved show, 
and quite possibly the most popular Disney afternoon show, DuckTales. And I'll be covering three games for that episode, folks. Yep, three games. Because I'm going to cheat a little bit by saying that one of the games, while it may not be 8-bit graphic-wise, it sure plays like one, and you know what I'm talking about. Well, I hope you liked this review. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel, as well as like and follow me on Facebook. Until then, this has been Masashi X. I bid you all farewell, take care, and stay tuned!